Good morning. For, the, for those of you who don't know, my name is Kyle. I'm one of the board members for Caleb House. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, we really, really couldn't do this without you, your support. And uh, we believe in the mission. That's why I'm here. And I think that's why all of y'all are here to support us. So thank you very much. I'm here to introduce Nick, Nick Ferguson, uh, from Homegrown Liberty. Nick Ferguson is an ecosystems engineer specializing in homestead farm and ranch design and optimization. With 10 years of experience all over the USA and abroad, he travels on consulting tours assisting landowners with troubleshooting problems on their land, assessing new land purchases, designing efficient layouts, and generally saving clients tens of thousands of dollars. Nick grew up designing ecosystems from a young age. Because of homeschooling, he was able to have an education specifically tailored to his aptitude and skill sets. His mission in life is to equip as many people with the knowledge and skills to thrive in the coming hard times. You can learn more about Nick and his services on his website, homegrownliberty.com. There are QR codes scattered around the room. If you guys just want to take a picture with your phone, you can get those and get access to his website there. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick. Nick, thank you very much for being here. Uh, yeah, the, the QR codes there on the tables are the presentation. So if you want to take that home with you, lots of people will ask kind of after the presentation, hey, can I get the slide deck or whatever? Just uh, open up your camera app and look at that. and Just tap on it and it'll open it up. Save a local copy. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Nick Ferguson. Um, and today I wanted to talk to you all about how to get independent of the feed store. Um, I noticed a, a recurring problem several years, in, well, really immediately um, once I started doing consulting full time. Everyone doing the homesteading thing ended up with the same kind of problem. They were designing their homesteads in such a way and the systems that they were working with in such a way that if times got tough and the feed that they were purchasing got expensive or scarce, the whole system that they had designed and built would just break down and wouldn't work anymore. And if your animals aren't getting fed, that means my children aren't getting fed. My family is not getting fed. And that's a big, big problem. So I started looking for solutions that would not necessarily put us back to the dark ages. Um, I don't want to live like the Amish do. I, would li I like the, the ability to use technology and force multiplying tools to get a lot more done with the limited time that I have. So I didn't want to go full on Amish. I needed something that was more resilient, something more old school without just completely abandoning all technology. And I found an old technology that is still in use today and is being used extensively in third world countries to feed livestock, and that is fodder trees. Um, so, it, it kind of comes down to this. If, uh, if the system only works, in good times, it's a broken system because bad times always happen. If you look at the scale of human history, this that we're living in right now is a very, very unusual thing. Human history is not normally like this, not so abundant and easy. Normally it's a lot tougher. So um, I want this system that I'm designing, my homestead, my farm, my ranch, to function if times are good and not tie me to, you know, dark ages lifestyle. But I also want it to function and, and do very well if times got really tough. So when times are good, we're, we're kind of in that feed store dependent, right? Um, there's a reason for it. It's easy. Really, when you think about it, the money that you're, that you're spending on this stuff, that is the cheapest livestock feed you could possibly expect to find. It's absurdly cheap for what you're actually getting out of it. 
the amount of calories and energy that's required to make that stuff to feed those critters. Stupid cheap. So I'm not saying that we don't use that. I use bagged feed. I use pellet feed. But the more I move away from that, the more of these systems that I have developed on my property, the more I'm able to, at the drop of a hat, if tomorrow the truck stopped running, I'm not worried about it because I can still feed all my animals. It's not a problem for me. It's a problem for a lot of people. It's a problem for the big producers. So what if, what if times got tough? The truck stopped running for whatever reason. Local, local, regional problem. Well, what, what does everyone have to do? They got to cut their stocking densities, right? Their profits are going to plummet. They're going to have to raise their prices. Or, you know, there's a point at which you can't raise your prices because you won't be selling anything. So you're going to have to eat into your profit margin. Prices are going to skyrocket. What if it's really, really bad? There are going to be people just going upside down. There are going to be people, uh, there are going to be people just losing their whole businesses because they're dependent on the feed. That's a, that's a bad time. I don't want to be there. So, there's a better way. We start with fodder trees. It all comes back to that. The fodder trees are trees that will feed our herbivores. And we can use those trees to actually feed insects. That's kind of getting a little bit more, uh, more in the weeds. But uh, we can, they're kind of the, the backbone. They're the thing that makes this whole system work. We can raise those insects for our insectivores, our chickens, our ducks, turkeys. And you can get a little bit more, um, more in-depth and invest more money into it with a hammer mill and pelletizer. And then, you know, as, this, as you're making this transition, by all means, supplement with the feed store feed. It's easy. I'm doing it. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Don't think you have to do everything beyond organic just at the drop of a hat. Start somewhere, do something, and start moving to more sustainability. So if times were to get tough, and you have these fodder trees grown on your property, you're using them, they're, they've already been established, you're getting some good productivity out of them, well, if, if feed prices go up, you can cut the amount of feed that you're feeding your animals because you don't need it. We've got something better. That means your profit margin is way higher than everybody else. What happens when everybody else's profit margins are dropping and yours are raising? You can expand your operation. You can get more stuff happening. If it gets really bad, you're the one that's going to have the healthy animals. Everyone else is going to have starving animals. You can corner the market. You're going to have stability. All right, so we're going to start with planting fodder trees. The foundation, if I had to pick one, it'd be white mulberry. That is Morris Alba, white mulberry. And the reason I say white instead of red, white mulberry has at least double the protein because it's been selected for thousands of years just about for high protein, high digestibility to feed silkworms. It's just been selected that way. It's not GMO or anything. Um, another couple we can use, hybrid willow. Hybrid willows grow insanely fast. You're going to see some pictures here in a little bit. Lacebark elm is fantastic, makes a beautiful landscaping tree. And hybrid poplar. And then with insect production, my number one pick, because they are so amazing at what they do, are black soldier fly larvae. They are ubiquitous throughout the U.S. They're only going to be present in the summertime. They just go dormant and hibernate for the winter. They're really easy to grow, and they will self-harvest out of the bins. You just put food in there, and they migrate out when they're ready to pupate into an adult. And you can have them migrate right into a bucket or a feed pan and just automatically feed your chickens. It's amazing. It's so cool. We can use millworms, dubia roaches, earthworms, but my number one pick is black soldier fly. Um, and then storage. The, the historic norm was to cut this stuff and just dry it in a, in a barn, dry it in the shade, and hang it, you bundle it, and it's tree hay is what it was called. And 
People have been doing this since BC. It's really old tech, and it works. So I made kind of a, a flow chart to explain how we can recapture and hold on to as much wealth as possible. And everything starts with those fruit and fodder trees. So we have yields over here. Some of these resources and fertility, people think of as trash. I've got leaves falling off of this. We've got branches I've got to deal with. That's a resource. Um, our animals produce manure. That's garbage. We've got to get rid of it. No, that's, that's fertility. That's, that's gold for me. My rabbits produce amazing manure for my garden. And they are pretty much free dog food. Free livestock guardian dog dog food means I have a pretty much free security detail guarding my livestock 24-7. So we've got our, we have fruit that we can take as a food yield. We've got mulch, leaves. Those leaves get fed to rabbits, cattle, sheep, goats. Anything that will eat leaves will go crazy for white mulberry. We can take a meat yield. We can sell, we can take a profit and sell some of these animals as breeders or pets. Of course, we got our manure. It can go to an earthworm bin. It can go straight to your garden. It can go to a black soldier fly larva bin. And we can get bait, or we can use that to feed our chickens, because chickens are only going to be able to get about 20% of the fodder leaves in their diet before you start to see a decline in their production. So you, they need higher fat, higher protein, you know, insect matter. And we've got the, the manure from whatever kind of worms in castings. You can take a profit off of that. You can sell worm colonies. They sell out every year. So the market is not being met. Every year, the market's not being met. You can sell this stuff as a small side hustle. We can take that, uh, the effluent, it's called worm tea. It's just the juices that are flowing out of that worm bin, and we can put that directly into something like a five-gallon bucket with a little air stone in there, and we can hook that up directly to what's called a Venturi siphon. They're like 10 bucks on Amazon, and we can suck that aerated nutrient solution out automatically as just as soon as the water turns on with your automated uh, irrigation controller for your garden. Again, like 20 bucks, 25 bucks, all the big box stores have them. You don't have to think about your garden getting irrigated and I'm ensuring I'm putting some fertility in that water automatically. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to worry about it. It's just happening. Really, really simple and easy. We've got our garden. All of, the, all of the stuff that can turn into dirt on my homestead goes to the chickens. And they turn it into dirt. They turn it into compost. And I recycle that. You're going to get to the point where this garden is so fertile, you have to put that compost somewhere else. And that's when... We're going to have more of that compost returning to our fruit and fodder trees. Okay, we're going to talk about um, coppicing and pollarding. Those are the only two terms that I really need to cover. Coppicing is going to cut these trees down to the ground every winter. They're cut down to a stump at the ground. Maybe a couple inches tall. As a stump gets bigger, you know, that, that cut will be a little bit higher just because there's more of a stump there. But it's at the ground. Pollarding is being cut up high, okay? I'm just going to show you some pictures so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. We planted these trees um, in April, several years ago. These are my boys. And these trees were only about 12 inches tall. And this was about three weeks later, they had doubled in size. Three weeks to a month later, they doubled in size. We planted these on 10-foot rows, 10-foot centers, and then each of the trees are spaced really tightly together, but 
I don't recommend you do that unless your goal is to just propagate a whole bunch. This was for propagation. I normally recommend spacing of about two foot in between each tree. We put 800 trees in less than an eighth of an acre in three hours. Of course, I have sandy soils, but if you're planting smart, you can plant a ton of trees really fast. This is the exact same row as that row one year later. Okay? Now, I have the, the first couple years, I've let these trees grow all the way and then put all of their energy back into the roots because I want them to get as big as possible before I start harvesting. This year, we're going to be cutting them to harvest them. And they'll grow about one inch a day. One inch, uh, yes, one inch a day. So again, we're back to shortly after we planted them. And I want you to see here, this is the only spot in the fodder forest, the boys named it, where I have white mulberry and the hybrid willow right next to each other. Okay? This picture, that's the hybrid willow, and that's the white mulberry. That's the exact same spot one year later. These trees grew a minimum of eight foot in a year. Most of it was 12 to 16 foot tall, both of them. They grow a lot. They grow fast. So we solarized in between the rows just to cut down on the vegetation because I wanted to get some different things growing in there. Um, but you can see where they're planted in this row. And I used the plastic weed barrier fabric just because it's convenient, it's easy, it lowers my maintenance, and makes it easy for me to involve um, my kids in maintenance because I travel a little bit. All right, that is the rose right there. And this was after they had been growing for about four months, I think, four months of growth. The exact same time the next year, these were over 16 foot tall right there. I think the tallest one was 18 feet. So that grew from the ground 18 feet by June. Okay, that is a 10 foot T post. So that is right there, eight foot off the ground. Just to kind of put it in perspective, to give you a little sense of scale. This is kind of what they look like after they've regrown in the springtime. This is in Costa Rica. These are some people uh, doing the same kind of thing in Costa Rica. And these are white mulberries, and they were cut down to the ground, and they're pushed out. So, I mean, that looks pretty nice. They look, it's, it's attractive looking. This is a, a natural coppice system. Beavers are doing this. These trees are re-sprouting, and they'll grow these little whips like that, and beavers are just harvesting this because they eat the cambium, the bark. These are some low pollards, and the reason why they, they pollard these is because they can harvest this mulberry um, for the fruit. This is for fruit production, but this is basically a low pollard. Again, I'm just giving you kind of some imagery so that you understand what this stuff looks like. These are the uh, these are pollards. So, I mean, these trees, when you treat them like this, they will live a long, long time. There are coppice trees that are hundreds of years old that when you cut them back down, it basically resets their, their genetic age clock. And it, they, they regrow like they're a young tree. So they, they'll live hundreds and hundreds of years. So everyone asks, well, what's the difference between the two and, and why would I do one versus the other? Well, pollarding is cutting up high, and that is for livestock inclusive systems. We don't want the livestock getting to coppice trees because they'll just strip all the leaves off and kill the trees. We want to put pollarded trees in livestock inclusive systems. So if I'm going for a silva pasture system, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that term, it is where you have pasture with trees providing shade and wind protection. So in a livestock integrated system, we have our sheep or our cattle on a pasture, we can do pollarded trees. I don't like pollarding trees because if, I'm, if I've designed that system 
to work. Um, and let's say things go a little sideways and you just can't get advanced medical care for whatever reason. If you're on a ladder, eight foot off the ground, and you fall, and you break a bone, and things have gone completely sideways in the world, you're in bad trouble. So I don't like pollarding because it's inherently just a little bit more risky. It's harder to work overhead. It takes more energy. Um, but you'll get more productivity out of your pasture. So there's kind of a trade-off. And if you're going to do it with mechanization, it requires specialized equipment. So um, my, my preference is for coppicing because it's, it's cheaper to manage it. Most of my clientele are managing smaller homesteads. We're not talking about trying to harvest 200 acres of something. We're talking about maybe an acre, and we're, we're working with hand tools a lot. So it's cheaper to manage. It's easier. You saw the pictures? It looks good. They look pretty. So if aesthetics are a concern, it looks pretty. Um, it's low to the ground. It's easy to reach. One of the drawbacks, though, is predation. This stuff is tasty. In fact, the young shoots and leaves are human edible, and they don't taste that bad at all. You can put them in your salads. So when it comes to, for instance, this isn't a big plus, but it's a little plus. It's something to consider. When it comes to the gray man approach, those fodder trees do not look like human food. No one's going to think that that's food. It's just bushes, right? So we have to protect them from anything that wants to eat leaves. Deer will just murder these trees because they taste so good. So the yearly workflow, we're going to reset every winter, whatever system you're going with, whether it's pollarding or coppicing, you're going to reset it to its zero. Okay? We're going to take it back to zero. You're going to prune it to the ground or you're going to prune it back to its pollarded, um, the scar tissue on the wood. And that scar tissue has a whole bunch of what are called meristematic cells. They are the, the plant stem cells, if you will. And they can turn into shoots or leaves or flowers or fruit or whatever, or bark or roots. There's a whole bunch of those stem cells, and we don't want to cut that scar tissue off. We just want to prune right to it because then it's going to push a whole bunch of new growth. It's going to be really easy for that tree to grow new shoots and leaves. So we're going to prune it down to that, and then we're going to process the waste material. Well, I mean, we can turn that waste material into biochar, charcoal. We can use it to burn in something like, I don't know if you've ever heard of a rocket mass heater or a J-tube stove. We can heat a greenhouse with the garbage, with the waste. Or we can turn it into charcoal and then mix that with manure or our compost and put it in our garden. And that charcoal holds onto a ton of nutrients in our garden. It's like a battery bank of nutrients for our garden. It's amazing in soils. And then you might be taking some of that material to propagate. So, I mean, if you picked up three hybrid willows and you got them in the ground, well, in, three, in, in one year, at that, that winter cut, when you're going to cut it down to the ground, you can take little four-inch pieces off of that and stick those in the ground and make new willow trees. That's all it takes. There's nothing magical or special. There's no special formula you dip it in or anything. There's no, nothing else. You literally take the stick, and you jab it in the ground, and that's it. You can actually take you know, eight-foot poles that are eight inches in diameter of this willow and dig a hole and jab the whole pole in the ground, pack the dirt around it like a post, and it'll grow a new tree. Okay? So we might take some cuttings off of it to propagate. And then during the management phase, during the summertime, we're going to be fertilizing, we're going to be mulching the trees, and we're going to be protecting them. And then when it comes to harvest, well, the first cut, I'm going to cut the, the first, so it's going to grow up, and it's going to get like four foot tall or so. And then I'm going to take a cut. And I use a, a pair of hedge trimmers. It's just battery powered. And I'm going to go a little bit lower than is comfortable to walk through the area. 
and I'm going to cut them. And then the next cut is going to be just a little bit higher where it is comfortable to hold that tool so that I'm not cutting that, that scar tissue off. Remember I talked about that, the meristematic cells? We don't want to cut that scar tissue off. That's why we cut a little bit uncomfortable the first time so that then all the rest of them, they're cut at a comfortable height for whatever height you are. So don't get stuck on, on the height. It doesn't have to be, you know, have to be out there measuring or anything. Just whatever's comfortable and convenient for however tall you are. And the reason why we do that, we're treating it like a lawn, right? When you mow your lawn, you don't scalp it down to the ground because what happens if you do? You kill the grass, right? If we did that with these trees, they're really hardy. You probably wouldn't kill them right away, but if you kept doing that all summer long, you will eventually kill them. They will exhaust all of their energy stores in the roots, and then they won't have any raw materials to make branches and leaves anymore. So what we want to do is we want to let it grow up just like a lawn, and then just like a lawnmower, you're going to cut it every time at the same height. So you're going to let it regrow however much you want to let it regrow. You might just let it grow six inches because you need some leaves, and they're going to be really soft and tender. And you just cut it at the same height. And we're just going to mow it down. And we're going to harvest that stuff, and we can feed it fresh. Um, we can dry it. We can ferment it. There's a bunch of stuff we can do it with it. And then we're just going to keep doing that. Everyone asks, you know, how many do I need or, you know, how often can I cut? It depends on the temperature, depends on the nutrition in the soil, depends on how much rain or irrigation they're getting. So, like I said, just wait and let it grow. I'd give it at least a foot to regrow, maybe two feet before you harvest it again. And that, that is going to change with how, how warm it is and how much irrigation you're giving them. All right, this is what winter reset looks like. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit, but there's the row of trees right there. Here's another row of, no, this is the, the space in between. That is the hybrid willows right there. So this is that same row of the mulberry. And all I did, because it was really fast, I've got a battery-powered circular saw. I just pulled the guard back, had my son pull the trees back a little bit so it didn't bind on the blade, and we just went down the row and zzzz. We had that row cut in like three minutes, 50-something feet, and we just cut it all down in just minutes, really quick and easy. That's what it looks like when you cut it all down. This is a hybrid willow from uh, at, growing at one of my clients. She just sent me pictures. She's so excited about them. She didn't cut this tree in its first year. She just let it grow. This is June of its second year in the ground. That's incredible growth. This is one that she cut. That's zoomed in. She cut that right there. December of its first year in the ground. It's exponential growth. Well, the, the, actually, this is a logarithmic scale growth. It put on 10 times, more than 10 times as much growth in its second year as its first year. That's pretty big. Now, that doesn't keep happening. It, it, once it gets pretty big, it stops doing that. Um, this is one that, that she harvested, and she's you know, cutting these kind of high. I like to cut them down here. Um, there's less breakage if you do that, and you can get through there easier if you have to you know, cross it with a tractor or a bush hog or whatever. Um, so, the, the ubiquitous question of how many trees? I always say yes, because it, it, there are so many things that, that change the equation. So I say just start small, get some, learn how to propagate them. Um, you, I've had clients that'll just say, well, I'm going to put in 2,000 trees. Great. Get after it. I, a lot of them just plant three and then they learn how to propagate, and then they can make as many of them as they want for just a little bit of effort. Um, and then don't, don't uh, skip over the, the fact that you might have a whole bunch of this stuff growing where you live already. You don't necessarily have to buy you know, the uber special magic trees that I sell. They're, they're just white mulberry. You probably have some white mulberry in your region somewhere. So you could always just start out with, just use what you have in your backyard. 
some trees are toxic to some critters, so you'll need to do a little bit of education. But there are a lot of free resources on your property already. So if you're, just to give you some, an idea of, of kind of how many trees we're talking about, if you're doing a whole acre, if you're doing eight foot rows, two foot spacing, we're talking about like 25, 2,700 trees in an acre. If you're doing, you know, a little bit bigger spaced out, four foot spacing, 12 foot rows, there's more room in between. That's like 900 per acre. That's still a lot of trees. The spacing, the spacing is situationally dependent, like, like we talked about. Um, I was going for propagation. I didn't care that a tree that was, you know, four or five dollars was going to get cut down in three or four years because if that tree will make me $200 worth of cuttings before it gets cut down, I'm good with that. So I packed as many in there as I could so that I could transition that space out of, you know, that kind of mode into just harvesting. So if you're going with propagation and you have a small space, pack them in there tight. If you're going with just production, you say, you know, I don't care about uh, propagation. I want to throw money at this now so that I don't have to wait as many years to get a lot of good production out of this. Then I would go with, I would start with your production spacing of like two to four foot apart. And then if you're going with something that's more of a pollard system um, where you're just going to be going through and going on a goat walk or a sheep walk where you go through with a pair of loppers or a pole trimmer and you just reach up and you snip branches off and your animals following behind you because you're a good shepherd and you're feeding them. They follow behind you and they just strip all the leaves off and you just walk and sip a cup of coffee and reach up there and, you know, snip the branches off. Then you're going for a much looser spacing. All right. When you plant them, bare root is going to be late winter because that's when bare root trees ship. You dig them up when they're dormant and you ship them when they're dormant. It's kind of like uh, getting surgery done. You don't want to get surgery done when you're awake. You want to be out cold. So we want these trees to be out cold when they're dug, their roots are all cut, and they're shipped. We want them to be unconscious so that when we get them in the ground, they wake up and they're like, oh, this is a great place to grow, right? Uh, if you're going with seed, because it's really cheap to grow them from seed, it's going to take longer. You're going to have to put in more work, more effort. If you're going with seed, you're going to plant those in the spring. And if you're going with potted trees, you're going to plant them in the fall. Feeding methodologies. Um, so we, we kind of touched on this just a little bit, but you can cut and carry it fresh. You can dry it as tree hay. You can ferment them as silage, and, or you can dry it, and you can put it through a hammer mill pelletizer. And then, so let's say you have rabbits and you have the hopper feeders or whatever, because um, you're growing free dog food, then you could actually invest in the equipment and then put it through that and then still utilize the hopper feeders. I like those because if I leave or go on vacation or I need someone to take care of my animals, it's really simple and easy. So there's something to be said for that. Also, um, you know, there are, there are yuppies out there. They got, you know, just a handful of chickens and, oh, that's Henrietta and that's, you know, Charlene, right? And they got six chickens, they're named, and they, they'll spend $20 for a bag of chicken treats. That's beyond organic, it's sustainably grown, it's whatever marketing you want to throw on it. And you can raise these insects and mulberry leaves, and you can sell really expensive chicken treats or chicken food. And there are insane people that will pay insane prices for it. And you can do that to subsidize and pay off your equipment purchase and make it pay for itself. Um, if you're cutting and carrying fresh. So I space my trees like that so that I can use a rabbit tractor for my grow outs. So as soon as they're weaned, they get taken away from the mama and they get put in a four foot wide by eight foot long. It's divided in the middle. So each batch of babies has a four foot by four foot section, and that gets drug in between the rows of trees. Most everyone's probably heard of a chicken tractor. Same thing. And then they're pruning the branches that are growing from the sides, and they're eating the grass and the clover that's growing up from the bottom. 
and I just open up the lid, and I grab a handful of branches, and I snip the leaves off, and I throw it right in the cage. It's right there, super simple and easy, and then they're fertilizing my trees, right? Um, we can also take care of that stuff, and, and we can feed it to, uh, to our, our cattle, our sheep, our goats. Ev pretty much everything that will eat leaves will go absolutely crazy for this stuff. You can cut it and hang it up to dry and dry it as tree hay. I've got some pictures of that here in a little bit. And uh, we talked about the pelletizing. Tools, really simple. You can use hand saws, you can use chain saws, you can use circular saws, reciprocating saws, whatever works for you. Machetes, bill hooks are very traditional. And then there's loppers and pruners, axes and hatchets. Um, as far as power tools go, like I talked about the hedge trimmer, that's a really quick and easy one. And they make uh, adapters, attachments that you can bolt onto the bar that will basically catch it and put it where you want it to go. I've got some pictures of that. And then a lawnmower. I'm actually going to be trying to prototype a way to put those hedge trimmers with some flexible plastic that will drop the trimmings directly into a sled so I can just line up and drive down the rows of trees and automatically harvest the stuff. It'll be pretty slick if I can pull it off. Um, so right here, like I said, a lot of this is going on in third world countries like India and Pakistan. There's a lot of it happening down there, um, down in Mexico and other Central American and equatorial regions. They do this a lot because it's a way to grow animals for you know, next to nothing. So here's a hedge trimmer, and it's got that kind of bucket attachment thing on the side. I mean, if you're handy, just a little bit of flashing, and you could bend it and pop rivet one of these yourself. It's, it's not complicated. And they're just cutting. This is actually harvesting tea, but it's the same kind of concept. We can cut that stuff and just dump it right into a cart. Here's a little handheld one. Tea trimmers. They're cheap, like 25 bucks on Amazon. Everyone talks about, well, this is all just hand tools. You can't scale this. So if you have, you know, 100 acres and you're wanting to actually scale something up and use mechanical harvesting, they make this stuff. They're harvesting tea here. It's just bushes harvesting leaves. You can do the exact same thing. That's a whole bunch of leaves right there. They just trimmed it off of those. Here's a tractor with the boom. There's a sickle bar right on the side, a little bit of modification, and you could actually be cutting and dropping that stuff into a little trailer that you're pulling behind. You just adjust the height so there's enough fall. You can just drop everything into a trailer. You can go both sides at the same time. Cut and carry fresh. Um, there are people that are raising dairy cows, pork, beef off of nothing but pasture, and white mulberry. This is uh, some white mulberry that I cut. And I cut it a couple days, three days before I left to, to do a consulting tour. And I had my wife snap a picture a week after that. So in 10 days, I had her measure it. And those branches right there were over 10 inches tall. 10 days, it grew 10 inches. That's a pretty good recovery rate. So here's some tree hay. Again, they just dried it, and then they bundled it, and then you can just carry that stuff. It's, it's, just, it's just hay. Alfalfa hay, they go nuts over it. The protein content that you're normally shooting for with just about all livestock across the board is about 16%. There's a little bit of variation. Chickens are a little bit higher. Um, but about 16%. Alfalfa pellets, alfalfa is about 17% on average. Anyone care to guess what kind of protein content you get out of the mulberry leaves? On the low end, we're talking about maybe 10%. On the high end, 
eight. The average is in the 20s. Normally, it's going to be around 30%, about double of what alfalfa is. So when it comes to high-protein stuff, you just can't beat this stuff. It's perennial. It keeps coming back. You don't have to plow the ground and keep working it. You plant it once, and you just harvest it for generations. And this stuff will grow and be harvestable for generations. Almost done, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, here's some dried leaves that I brought, and uh, uh, I did a presentation on, on fodder trees. Just, Mike, we did a presentation on fodder trees and just dropped these in the pen, and they got mobbed and stripped of their leaves in moments. Sheep, goats, cows, they all do the exact same thing with it. Here's some silage. Silage, does everybody, show of hands, does everybody know what silage is or no? Okay, silage is fermented plant matter. Normally, it's going to be corn. You'll harvest the corn in the milk phase when it's not quite ready and ripe, but there's a lot of carbohydrates in it. And you'll harvest that, and you'll chop it all up, and you put them in big pits. You can do it on a small scale in five-gallon buckets. We can do the exact same thing with mulberry leaves. We can do the exact same thing with the willow. You can mix them all up. All it is is you are basically just lacto-fermenting the leaves, You're kind of pickling them. And, and yeah, that, that's, there's, it's very simple. You'll uh, normally use a little bit of sugar water. You're, you're not trying to get it saturated. It's not going to be like soaked in, in moisture. It's not like making sauerkraut. If you have a ton of moisture in there, it's not going to do well. You want it just damp, and you're going to pack that stuff in some kind of a vessel, a five-gallon bucket, 55-gallon drum, whatever works for you in your situation. And then you cap it, you put a number or a label on it. I prefer to just number the barrels, the buckets, and put the data in a spreadsheet so I can see, okay, barrel number 20 started on this day. It's probably going to be done on this day, but it can just sit there for years. So you could stockpile a whole year's worth of livestock feed and just store it in a barn and keep it rotated. So you could always have a year's worth of livestock concentrate feed. Now, you can't just feed this stuff straight. They will have diarrhea that will look like something out of a horror movie because it's so high in protein. You have to be careful. Like, this is, this is powerful stuff. But, I mean, that's really powerful to be able to have one year of concentrated feed in rotation stored in a barn. You know, there was a thing not too awful long ago, the year without a summer. A lot of people died. You can pelletize it, so you'll have to dry it. Guys, there are, there are perennial grains that we can be growing. There's perennial sorghum. It's basically a one-to-one -one replacement for corn. You can take that perennial sorghum that doesn't need a whole lot of processing, and you can put it in this mixture, and you could basically make your own pelletized feed at whatever ratio you need to make it for whatever animal you're feeding. So, we can grow that food for just about free. It's, a, it's, it's work, but I'm not paying dollars that I had to earn to be able to do this stuff. That means, if, if you think about this, I'm, it's not like I'm saving $100. If I had to spend $100 on feed, for instance, well, I don't just have to earn $100. I have to earn like $140 to be able to get $100 worth of something because I'm taxed. There's sales tax. There's all of that extra stuff. So it's not like I'm just keeping $100. It's like I'm keeping a whole heck of a lot more. And then on top of all that, I get to divorce myself from dependence on systems that are normally supporting us as homesteaders and the more we can do that, the more we can keep wealth within our control and within our family's control, and we can kind of snowball wealth. Of course, it builds resiliency. I'm almost sold out of trees. I'm sorry that the timing of this is, is kind of late, but 
Um, if you're interested in them, I do sell them on rareplantstore.com. Now, I want to open it up to questions. I know there's probably 50 questions. Regular silage chopper is fine. Um, wood chippers, leaf shredders. So when you're harvesting this stuff, it's gonna be, uh, the, sorry for, for anyone listening to the, or watching the recording, how do you chop the silage? So when you're harvesting this stuff, it's gonna be really, really soft and supple. It's gonna be really easy to shred. There are people that will use like the leaf shredders. It's like a string trimmer and it's round normally, and there's like a spring trimmer in there, and you just dump the leaves in, and it just shreds them into a bag, so you can get those nasty leaves into some plastic bags and send them off to the landfill instead of composting them. We can use that same kind of thing and just throw those stems in there, the leaf and the stem, everything. Because when you're, when it's all that new regrowth, it's just, it's just soft. So it's really quick and easy to put it through that. Um, so what kind of soil types for mulberry? Mulberry is one of the hardiest, toughest trees out there. They grow from Canada down to the tip of Florida. So in the continental U.S., they will grow everywhere in the U.S. And they grow in every kind of soil. The only real limitation that you're going to face with mulberry as far as um, environmental conditions that everyone's growing things in is low uh, rainfall. They, they do not handle like desert conditions, so you're gonna have to irrigate if you're in dryland situations. But for most of the US, like here, you throw them in a, in a crack in the concrete and they'll grow. So soil conditions, don't really worry about it. Anything from clay to you know, heavy clay to, uh, uh, to sandy soils. So, so really swampy areas, generally what, what's going to be the best thing, um, if you can at all, is to put in what amounts to some ditches and berms. You dig a little bit and you pile up some soil so that you can concentrate the water into the, the wetter areas and you can get a little bit of dry feet. Um, the, the hybrid willow and hybrid poplar will do best in really, really wet conditions. The willow does excellent there. Um, mulberry will stand a lot of that, but if it's super wet, then I prefer to lean more towards the willow and the, the hybrid poplar. What's that? Um, not nearly as good, but like, uh, you know, I, I go back to the rabbits a lot because um, security on the homestead is really important, and, I, and dog food is expensive. Uh, you know, if you actually, most people don't actually pay attention to how much they're paying for dog food. It's normally about the same price as human food. It's insanity. So I really like having um, free dog food. And the willow, you can grow the willow and almost exclusively feed rabbits willow, and they'll do just fine on them. So the willow is, is gonna be more in the single digits to at the most in, in the low 20s in protein content. It's still great for cattle. Yep. Yep. With the white mulberry, you were talking about the uh, percent protein in the leaves. Yep. Does that vary during the growth cycle like it, yes, does, it does with grasses? Yep. yep. Across the board. All those trees, all the grasses, it'll be a lot higher in the, in the springtime and in the early summer. And then once it gets really hot, dog days of summer, that protein content starts dipping. And then, you know, towards fall, if, as soon as the leaves start to look like they're going to be changing, you want to leave the trees alone and let them, it, it's kind of like giving them a rest, let them recover, and they're going to pull all of those sugars down into their roots and, and be able to 
pop up some, some really good growth in the spring. But you know, as that summer progresses, that protein content will be dropping. I was just curious what you do for uh, deer. Uh, deer, um, I like to use electric fence. And uh, a lot of those companies will have bait cups that are aluminum. And they have a little felt pad in there. And you can drop some scent in there. And then the deer come along. And they have wet noses like dogs. And they'll either lick it or sniff it. And then that three joules to 12 joules of stored energy jumps out and bites them on the nose. And then they're terrified of the electric bees that live here. Yeah, that stuff smells really good, but the electric bees are, are not, not good. And so generally they'll leave them alone if you get something like that going. There's another question. Yes, I'd like to ask about propagation. Yep. And um, your plant specifically, what we can expect per plant, how long before we can take cuttings and replant, and how many cuttings maybe in yeah. a period of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it depends on how you're treating them and the environmental conditions. You could cut, let's say, the, the willow and hybrid poplar. They'll grow about eight foot in their first year with, with decent conditions. And you can take those and cut them into... Um, four inch pieces, um, I'm not going to attempt to do math in my head on the spot, but I mean, eight foot times 12 inches divided by four, it's about that many cuttings. It's going to be a couple hundred, I think, if I had to guess, um, off of just one stick, right? And if it's multi-stemmed, you'll get even more. And uh, as so the, the willow and the poplar, you can just jab them in the ground and they'll grow. With the white mulberry, they don't do well like that. Those are called hardwood cuttings. The white mulberry, you have to use softwood cuttings and you will treat them with uh, rooting hormone and put them in what's called an intermittent mist system. And it, basically all it is is like those the grocery stores that have the, you know, the, the thunder sounds and then psh, it starts spraying a little bit of mist on the veggies to keep them crisp. Well, that's just reducing the transpiration so they don't wilt. You can do the exact same thing with the mulberries, and they just get misted about every, every 10 minutes or so. They'll get a little 10-second you know, shot of mist, and that keeps the leaves damp so that they don't dry out. And it gives them time to build some roots. So with the mulberry, you'll go with that. And then um, the mulberry are, tend to sometimes grow slower in their first year than the willow. So you might not be able to get cuttings off of those in the first year. You might have to wait till the second year with the mulberry. But with, with good conditions, they should do just as well. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it, it's a push-pull. The sooner that you start harvesting cuttings or, or any kind of material from them, the slower it's going to take them to build up energy and root mass, which is really going to drive it. It's like a savings account. You let it build up some interest and compound interest. The, the more you let that savings account build up, the more you can withdraw. So if you're really pushing hard to get stuff propagated quickly um, because the numbers, you need to get more numbers, then you know, you'll, you'll sacrifice a little bit of longevity and production long term by you know, front end loading it. Five minutes. Okay, microphone. She's coming. That way everyone can hear you in the back. All right, uh, what's the benefit of fermenting? Um, it's, so it's going to, it's basically going to pre-digest those, so the digestibility and usability of the nutrients goes up. And also it's, it's going to store and maintain the, the nutrition longer. So if you dry it, you're going to have more degradation because there's more oxidation. Um, the more surface area, the more it's going to oxidize. The more it oxidizes, the more you have nutrition loss. So if you ferment it and it's kept airtight, you're going to, have a, you're going to retain those nutrients for far longer. On top of that, 
it's kind of pre-digested and they'll, the animals will get more out of it. No, no, they, they can eat the fermented stuff. I thought you, okay. Maybe yeah, I yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. Um, now, some, some critters might not be, be interested in it at first, but once they get a taste for it, um, they'll, they'll go crazy for it. Yep. Ooh. Oh, I guess it's on. Have you done calculations about, let's say you have just hypothetical situation. You have land, enough for the cattle to graze on during the summer, spring, fall. Mm -hmm. Do you have any rough calculations like, how much of this do you need to plant for a cow for to to win for over the winter? Okay, because there, just there's depends. no way to to calculate that. There are so 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 many variables at play. Um, like that that'd probably be a, a calculation for like AI or something. Okay. okay. Um, there's there's literally thousands of variables to take into account. Um, that's why I say just get some stuff planted and start. Just expand until, you know, as you're building that resiliency, keep expanding that until you're getting so much that you're meeting your needs. And then, then you'll figure out what works on your site with your environmental conditions, with the amount of rainfall you get, with the, the particular nut uh, nutrient deficiencies in your soils. It's just kind of a, you have to feel it out. It's kind of like, how many animals can I have on a pasture? you have to develop what's called the grazer's eye. Like we were talking about earlier, Joel Salatin, he talks about that a lot in Salad Bar Beef. Thank you. Anybody else? One more, One more. over there. Do you have research or data on horses or horse adjacent creatures eating this donkeys mm -hmm. zebras if you're really feeling it yep um so all of those trees that i listed there are perfectly fine for horses and any of those so any any uh, monogastric animal the monogastrics normally have problems horses um and anything like that alpacas llamas you have more toxin issues with them uh, they they go crazy for it, and there's no no toxicity issues. Um, on the subject of dogs, do you have dogs? Do you feed them your rabbits? What else do you feed them? Do you buy from the store? Yep. Yeah, um. So we keep dog food in a in a hopper feeder. If uh, eat if they have anything else to eat they will skip eating the dog food because they don't like it nearly as much. I will take the rabbits out of the cage. They get cervical dislocation. It takes half a second, and then I pitch the rabbit over the fence. The alpha gets the first one, the beta lines up, the beta gets the second one, and so on and so forth. Um, your, if your dogs aren't trained to eat like that, then you might have to you know, incrementally get them there by you know, putting a little bit of a sear and maybe some seasonings on it. You know, you skin it. I wouldn't worry about gutting it. Um, but you can just slowly transition them to the point where you literally just break its neck and chuck it over the fence. Um, but yeah, we have the, the dog food hopper feeder because if we go on, on a camping trip or a hunting trip or whatever, and we're going to be gone for a month, I want my animals to be able to be fed, um, and I don't want to burden somebody taking care of things with going out there and breaking bunnies' necks, you know? All right. Um, I'm going to be around for just a little bit, and then I have to get on the road. So any more questions, please feel free to grab me. Um, I really appreciate y'all's attention and the great questions. Thank you, Nick. And if you didn't get a copy of his presentation, there's a few papers on the different tables. And if you'll take your phone and scan the QR code, everything that he had up here, that way yep. if you didn't get, get it or get the notes. So feel free to take a picture. Thank you all, all for coming. Thanks.